Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Larry Scallon, as you already heard. This is a talk called Tales from the Barrack Walls. It's a, a military history talk, a heritage talk, regaling our military history, heritage, people, place and events from the last 200 years, with a special emphasis on County Kilkenny and James Stevens Barracks in particular. My name is Larry Scallon, as you already heard twice now. Uh, you can see there, I started my career as a young soldier in 1988. And the gentleman there alongside me is a, a young man called Michael Wall then, and I'll, I'll, that'll become important at the very end. In the middle picture there, I'm with Robert Fisk. I had the good luck to spend a half day with him in Beirut. Uh, I was sent one time to bring a, a gentleman whose brother had died in the Lebanon in action years earlier, and I was made the coordinating officer or the liaison officer for his visit. And as part of that visit, I got to spend half a day with Robert in his apartment and then down at a couple of cafes on the seafront in Beirut. Robert's voice is sadly missed right now because you know he was an authority on the Middle East and sure, we all know what's happening there now. On the right hand side, you can see the four generations of my family going back to the foundation of the Irish state. My grandmother John, bottom left, uh, was a Free State soldier in 1922. His first cousin, also John, and their surname is Redmond, was a private who died in the Battle of the Pili in Flanders, Flanders in uh, 1914. My grandfather was a soldier in the emergency. My uncle Mert is top left. He was a company sergeant in the Curragh. And there I am, uh, top right, in my last capacity as a company commander. So I went from being a private soldier, to being a corporal, to being a sergeant, to being a company sergeant, to being a second lieutenant, to being a lieutenant, a captain, and finally a commandant. So I had plenty of transitioning uh, through my Defence Forces career, and I learned a lot. I learned a hell of a lot. It was a brilliant time, and it, it encouraged me to think very differently about things, or to critically think about things, not just take stuff at face value. My two degrees are from are part of what we would now call a, profi a professional military education. So my education comes from my military career. When I was selected to undergo potential officer training, I did my level seven degree as part of that. And if I didn't pass my degree, I wouldn't have been commissioned as an officer. And then to become, to be promoted to the rank of commandant, I had to pass my junior command and staff course and by Parallel with the command and staff course is your second degree, which is a level eight. Both of those were conducted by uni, um, university, and both of those definitely taught me the, the capability to critically think about things. And that's the difference about life as an NCO or a private and life as an, as an officer. You have to be able to evaluate and come up with your own different perspectives as an officer much more than as an NCO. Ken Stevens Barracks, built in 1801, uh, completed in 1803, built by Major Switzer. Now, he didn't physically build it, he was the engineer in charge of it. Like any good officer, he probably spent most of the day in the castle drinking tea or whatever else was on offer. But in the middle of the 18th century here, you can see that this is the, the location of all the barracks around Ireland. So you can see we were very, Ireland was saturated with military establishment of a British nature. In order to maintain a peaceful, in brackets, a coexistence between all parts of our Irish society at the time, there had to be a very strong military presence because the larger community was being dominated by the, the smaller community, and we all know our Irish history. That's what the barracks system looked like in uh, the mid 18th century. Here's one of our earliest maps of Kilkenny. There are two pre-existing barracks is in Kilkenny City. You have horse barracks, which is across the road here, and you have the foot barracks, which is now Evans' home, which is now the Butter Gallery. There were the two barracks. Both of those barracks are connected to their main streets by lanes. The lane across the road is known as Horse Barrack Lane, even to this day, and the lane leading from Butler Gallery, Gallery up to Langton's Pub or Hotel is known as Barrack Lane. So they, are, they still retain their historical names and references. And our parade is called the parade because it was a military parade ground, not for any other reason. It was the parade ground for the castle. 
This is the configuration in the southeast of Ireland uh, towards the middle of 18, 1814 or that way. You can see in Kilkenny there, it has a large group of, a small group of cavalry, 34 soldiers, and a full battalion of soldiers. And if you add up the numbers with Kilkenny and those in Freshford, Orlingford, Johnstown, Kilmanagh, and probably Callan, you will get about a thousand soldiers. And that's the normal size of a regiment of the day. So the soldiers' headquarters would be Kilkenny, but they would be deployed to satellite towns in the vicinity of Kilkenny. So that just gives you an idea how the British regiments were deployed at the time. So when the barracks was built in 1801, they selected a site on the eastern environs of the town. We all know where the modern barracks is. Uh, it's over at the junction of Ballybuck Street and the Castlecomer Road. And this is the site here. And this is how it was configured up until the late 1850s. It had capacity to hold about a thousand soldiers. Now, not all the thousand soldiers stayed in the actual barracks. Some of them stayed in the adjoining fields under tents. If you know, Bergen's Yard used to be there. It was a pigeon course years ago. That was an adjoining field where which could be, uh, a tented village could be erected if required. This is the barracks then, almost as it is in a modern sense. Uh, and uh, it has the addition of IJK block here. The officer's mess is completed and the church is built in the 1850s. And that gives you more or less, except for the modern introduction of the dining hall, the, the, the garage, and now the gym, that's there. But what was the first effect of having a barracks located there? Well, you have an, a lot of public houses, uh, uh, which immediately spring up in the vicinity of any work on barracks. There's a thousand thirsty men, predominantly, living there. So this is what happens. And one of, in my opinion, the streetscape of Parliament Street, across the road from what was the brewery site and before that horse barrack lane, all those public houses, which are still today there today, were probably public houses going back as far as the middle of the 18th century because of the trade they were able to get from the, the soldiers who were accommodated across the road. This is what a Kilkenny militia soldier looked like. This is a, a representation of an officer from the middle of the 19th century. The Kilkenny militia always had yellow facings on their uniforms. And this here is actually, the, this uniform here is actually in the National Museum in Dublin. And that is a bandsman from the Kilkenny militia. And that is 100% original. The, the Kilkenny militia band was the best military brand in the country by a country mile. Why? The Duke of Ormond spent a lot of money on getting them uh, and having them well presented. And they were the highlight of lots of the social events that would happen in Kilkenny throughout any given year. So I'm going to start my first tale. Lieutenant Colonel Buchanan, Buchanan Riddle was an uh, officer commanding of the 3rd Battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps located in James Stevens Barracks, now called James Stevens Barracks, then to Kenny Barracks, in 1899. The Boer War was in, uh, had, had commenced and he was tasked with getting the 3rd Battalion up to operational strength and they were going to move over to South Africa. And these photographs that you're going to see in a second are from 24, uh, were, issued, were published in the 24th of February 1900 in the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News. Uh, and you can see here they are coming into the barracks. If anybody's familiar with the barracks, you'll see the main gate here. You see a little uh, memorial on the wall to Lion the Dog. It's even back there then. And here are uh, the last reinforcing group for the battalion coming into the barracks. Here we have the officer corps, the officers of the regiment uh, for their formal photograph just before they deployed. And here you can see they have a mascot, and he's a pony off a poodle. Uh, I don't know why, but but there you go. Here's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Riddle, Buchanan Riddle, in the middle of his troops, as you would expect him, and his lieutenants would be at the back, his majors alongside him here, and his senior staff officers also alongside him. Here's the entire regiment on parade on the barrack square. There's over a thousand soldiers here. They're being uh, inspected. We would now have a, milit a military review before we go overseas, or a ministerial review. 
Here there was a field marshal, Field Marshal Roberts, who was living in Waterford at the time. He was the officer who reviewed the troops before they deployed. Here they are being addressed by Field Marshal Roberts. And these are all taken at the end of October 1899. So he has a large crowd. I wouldn't say these boys are here in much now. Uh, and a few of them have swords. They're very obviously the officers. So uh, they, were, they were trying to stay out of sight in case the general would give them a job. Here are the armourers getting all their weapons ready for going off. They needed all to be checked before they went. That room is still used in the barracks today. It's no longer being used as an armourer's store, though. It's now a, a, an annex for the museum where we store some equipment. Here's the, the farrier shotting a horse before they went. And look at the quality of the dovetail joints on the wood. They were hand-making all of the timber boxes for the, for the officer's kit to go out. This building here is still the carpenter shed uh, today. So th the change in the barracks hasn't affected there. Here's the soldiers getting ready to hand in their service uniforms to get issued with their khaki uniforms to go to go off to South Africa. Here they are fitting on their hats. This is all, again, uh, this is the DBO yard, if any of you are uh, familiar with the barracks. Here we have them being the company sergeant is checking everybody off to make sure they have their equipment. This, again, is a sort of the barracks looking at A, a to F block, looking down the side. Here you see the transport section carrying out some pistol drill on the square. The dog looks very disinterested. Uh, and you can see the lads, the transport officer here is, uh, he's uh, supervising his soldiers here, just doing some pistol drill. I doubt very much they were about to fire anything because they were firing out onto the roach pond. Uh, here the guys are loading their ammunition up, getting ready for their, their move to the ship. Here they are, again, these are brilliant photographs, seldom if ever seen before, and all totally embedded within the four walls of James Stevens Barracks. Here is the band getting ready to play for the, the field marshal as he comes on parade. This arch is very no noticeable, and our headquarters building is along here, and our logs officer works out with this building to this day. Here's F Company of the King's Royal Rifle Corps 3rd Battalion getting ready for inspection in their khaki uniforms by Field Marshal Roberts. Here is Field Marshal Roberts getting uh, in, in all his attire. Field Marshal Roberts was the first, probably only Field Marshal to actually die in World War I. He died in San Omar. He wasn't on operational service, but he was out there to visit the Indian soldiers who had already been deployed into the trenches from India. Here's the officer's mess ready for his dinner. Nice. I've had the privilege of dining in the officer's mess many a time. And the only difference I ever had in the taste, the taste of food across the barracks was the same. But when I was an enlisted soldier, I got my food for free. When I was an officer, I paid for every meal. So I would quite often sneak down to the dining hall and have a chat with the cooks and get my dinner for free. <laughs> so, I, But here is the enlisted men having that same dinner. In, in the church, which is now the church, and two squash courts actually in there. It doesn't even look like a church inside, but the guys are having their meals here. The guys left on the 4th of November, and on the 24th of November on the SS Sar Sarvia, and this is the very first steel-built ship in the world. Uh, it was a Cunard cruiser. It used to do transatlantic. Its last job in its life was to bring soldiers to and from the Boer War. And... The crux of the thing for our, our King's Royal Rifle Corps is on the 24th of January. Uh, the 3rd Battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps were told to attack Speen Cop. Lieutenant Colonel Riddle, he was in charge of half his, but Buchanan Riddle had half his battalion. His major had the other half of the battalion. They attacked up one of the crests on with the trench system up here. And just as they were cresting the top of the ridge, when Lieutenant Colonel Buchanan Riddle had been told by his soldiers that the mission was taken, he went to the front to make a decision on where to deploy his soldiers, and he was shot dead by a Boer sniper. Lieutenant Colonel Riddle, Buchanan Riddle has a permanent memorial in St. Canis's Cathedral. If you ever go into St. Canis's Cathedral, you can read his story there. He was dead before the article was published in the, the Sporting Magazine. His wife had the foresight to put up a permanent memorial to him because nowadays who has money anymore or, or would we would normal people have had money? No, they wouldn't, but she did. And now we still know about his story. 
So the memorial, a memorial to me is a memory trigger. A memory trigger is something which is encouraged you to think about an event that happened in the past. And we're talking about him tonight, and that means she has achieved what she set out to do, to have a lasting memory of her husband in Count Kilkenny, and in Kilkenny City in particular. She also paid to have a proper headstone put up for him in South Africa. The next man I'm going to talk about is Hervey Guy Francis Edward de Montmorency. Hervey de Montmorency, the first Hervey de Montmorency that was in Kilkenny was Strongwall's uncle. That's how far back this family goes. Uh, Hervey was born in 1868. Uh, he was born the son of a soldier who was in Gibraltar. Uh, his probably one-time ancestor, the original Hervey de Montmorency's ancestral home was Dunbrody Abbey near, near New Ross in County Wexford. Hervey went to Woolwich Military Academy in 1883 as a 15-year-old boy, and he ended up being the youngest officer in the British Army as an artillery officer in 1887. He stayed in the Army until 1880. When he left the Army then, because he, uh, he commenced uh, proceedings through the courts in Ireland to get access to some money that he believed he was entitled to from one of his relatives dying, and a young officer having a claim like that in a civilian court didn't go down well in Victorian Britain. And he had to resign. When he resigned his commission, he became a steeplechase jockey. And he had a, quite a varied career between 1880 and 1889. But what I did find in 1889, his horse withdrew at the 24th fence in the Grand National. The, the horse that won the Grand National that day was a horse called Drahada. So Irish horses were winning the Grand National a long time, didn't they? Uh, he then went to South Africa. He was working as a supervisor in a gold mine and the Boer War started. And he joined the Rhodesia Volunteers, uh, where he worked for a, the full year of a contract that he had signed. And he spent most of his time in a place called Tallulah Tally Farm. And this was a, a, a fort which protected lines of communications for the British Army. So after his year was over, he returned to Great Britain and he then got very adventurous and he went off to do some treasure hunting in the Cocos Islands, uh, which is south of Costa Rica, of all places. He didn't find anything. He came home, uh, he went back again, thinking that they had better information and uh, unfortunately they didn't find anything the second time. And then in 1907 he comes home and he marries Evelyn. Uh, his wife Evelyn and himself have never have any children, but uh, they're married and living in the UK. And then he gets his Irishness comes out of him. Harvey decides that he wants to be an Irish nationalist, and he joins the Irish the United Irish League. John Redmond asks him to take over the the running of the United Irish League in London, and he says no, he doesn't want to do that. He runs for the county council in London and fails to get elected. So then he comes home and he sets up house in Wicklow. While in Wicklow, he becomes director of the volunteers for County Wicklow and he becomes very involved in the training of the volunteers and his military service as an officer in the British Army was very important. And he then sets about training the Wicklow volunteers and supervising their musketry. He gets so involved with the musketry and this, obviously he's, he understands they don't have enough weapons and he, he then develops with guys who are like-minded, the, not the hot gun running, but the Kilkool gun running. He's involved in that. But just as they're about to set off on their Kilkool gun running escapade, a chap called Gravillo Precip shoots dead Archduke Ferdinand and Sophie Chopak, his wife, in Sarajevo on the 28th of June in 1914, setting off a whole process of events that would eventually lead to a declaration of war. Meantime, Harvey is out on a, a ship, a yacht, with an engine in it called the Chota, and they rendezvous with a, a larger ship called the Kelpie, of the Quiche Lighthouse. And while out there, the weapons are transported into with Harvey helps and the, the crew, and they bring those guns, that consignment of arms and ammunition, almost to the shore in Kilcool, where the weapons are transported onto smaller 
uh, craft and then they're landed and there's a very successful gun running into Kilcool and that ends on the 3rd of August 1914. On the 4th of August there's a declaration of war by Great Britain and Harvey immediately offers his services to the, to the British Army and he's given a commission into the Royal Dublin Fusiliers but he very quickly says and I quote he didn't want to be to command a bunch of Larkinite dockers. So he event he uh, straight away requests he requests a transfer to his old corps, which was the artillery corps, and he's granted that transfer. Uh, here he is in a in a picture taken in Kilkenny in January 1915. He's part of the 75th Brigade of the 16th Irish Division uh, and they all move off by the middle of May 1915 and they're at war for the entirety of the four years. I, I have uh, the outcome of there's very few of those officers make it through the entire war on scale like they get they get hammered to be honest with you uh, and uh, they have a tough time. Uh, this is his medal index card uh, showing the date he deployed, the 31st of the 8th, 1915, and his medal awards. And he was a Royal Field Artillery Officer, and he ends up being a Major. These are his medal group, so he's his DSO, his four war medals, his uh, three medals from the Great War, and he's also awarded the uh, Crew de Corps from France with uh, a second award on that medal. He comes home after the war, he's disenchanted, he's living... Uh, He's, he's lost his nationalism and he, uh, in, in uh, 1920, we all know uh, about Bloody Sunday and we'll talk about it again in a few minutes, but after Bloody Sunday, Harvey applies for a job with the Auxiliary Division and he's awarded a position as a, an officer, an intelligence officer, with, the, with a military intelligence officer working seconded to the Auxiliary Division of the Royal Irish Constabulary. And he works in the Westmead area, and in Athlone in particular, and his contract is from January to June 1921. After the, this, the war ends, or Anglo-Irish War ends, and there's a treaty, Harvey blends back into society in the UK. He writes three books. The main one would be The Sword and Stirrup, uh, which tells about his military life and his his life as an adventurer around the world. Excuse me. And uh, he he dies in 1942, and his wife lives until 1978, I believe. And when she died, there was a large article written about him in a newspaper. So here's a man that went from being a British soldier to an ardent nationalist back to being a member of the auxiliary division of the RAC, all in one lifetime. <laughs> an amazing life. Next man I'm going to talk about is Company Sergeant Major Frederick William Hall, VC. Frederick was awarded the Victoria Cross in 1915. He was born in Patrick Street in Kilkenny. His father was the drum major in the, in the Kilkenny Militia Band, paid by, by the Duke of Ormond or the Marquis of Ormond, I'm not sure. He's the gentleman here in Ireland. He's a Kilkenny man. He's an Irish man. He's a local man from here. And he's with his battalion, the 8th Battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, on the 24th of April, 1915. And his battalion is subjected to the second ever gas attack. The first one being to the French soldiers two days earlier on the 22nd. He is his company sergeant major's responsibility for the organisation of his troops. They were tasked with moving forward on the battlefield. They moved to a forward position. Two of his soldiers were wounded uh, behind him. And uh, he went with two other soldiers, a corporal and a private, to try and collect the wounded soldiers. The two other sol soldiers with him were actually wounded. They returned to the trench and he went forward. He got to one of the forward soldiers. He managed to get him up on his back. And as he lifted his head up gently to try and push himself back, he was shot dead by a German sniper. Frederick William Hall was buried in the battlefield and his body was lost during the war. There's no record of where he's buried. Uh, his mother was sent a posthumous VC, and this is the letter she received from King George. And the, the, the actual medal was presented to her by another veteran, uh, Sergeant W. Smith, DSM, 
at some point in time. So there's an actual picture of a woman that spent three, as they said themselves, great years in Kilkenny. A road in his hometown is named in his honour, it's called Valor Road. There are now three VC winners from that road. Uh, Strickland was another one from World War I, and the second, there was another gentleman during World War II. If you go to Eat, and if you go to the Brooding Soldier, which is a Canadian memorial, you are within half a kilometre of where Frederick William Hall died. He is, on, he is commemorated by name on the Menin Gate. He also has a paving slab, which never made it to Kilkenny. Bear in mind, he's a Kilkenny man. His enlistment paper says he's from Kilkenny. A paving slab was gifted by the British government to the home village of every soldier who was awarded a VC during World War I. The people of St. Helens, where his family lived for a number of years, claimed Frederick Hall. Unfortunately, we didn't know in time or maybe that paving slab would have been in Kilkenny, where it rightly belongs. Three mothers, ten sons. I'm quickly going to narrate the story of three families in Kilkenny. Every recruitment poster you see there is poignant and to the point and will encourage men to join the army. In this one here, you actually see there's an Irish flag included in the recruitment poster. On no recruitment poster, issued in Ireland, do you see an overt British flag? It just doesn't happen. They, they, it, it is very obvious that they were gearing themselves towards Irish patriotism and an Irish willingness to go fight for Belgium, to go, you know, stop the Germans slaughtering our children, to, you know, use their Irishness to in encourage guys or entice guys to join the army. Lots of the guys were already in the army. Many Irishmen had fine military careers in the British army, leaving aside the baggage that goes with colonialism and all that. We're not talking about that tonight. We're talking about their stories. And the conditions they ended up with were we cannot comprehend. When we go outside this door tonight, we're going to say it's freezing. We're going to wrap ourselves up in modern clothing. We're going to go home in the centrally heated houses. These guys lived in trenches over winters much much colder than what we're going to experience tonight and survived in conditions where they didn't know tomorrow morning if they were going to be alive and this was a real you know this was this wasn't make-believe this was real and and uh, they went willing willingly to participate there was never one conscript from ireland conscription never happened in ireland in world war one it was all voluntary Chapel Lane, Margaret Shea, Neil Lacey lives. She loses four sons in the Great War. She loses John, Richard, Patrick, and Joseph. Two of them in the Royal Irish Regiment, one in the uh, Dublin Fusiliers, and one of them in the Royal Irish Fusiliers. All killed in action. Uh, it's in 1516 and two of them in 1917. Joseph is actually buried in Beersheba in Palestine, as it still says today on, on the Commonwealth War Grave Commission. Richard is buried in Sanctuary Wood. Patrick is buried in Railway Dugout. John is buried in Balial. And Joseph is buried in Beersheba. Here's the, the pension record for the family. Uh, only one of the four sons was married, so three of them were bachelors living at home with their mother and their father. You can see here Region 13, that's the region. Southern Ireland is always Region 13. D means dependent, so it's not a widow, it's a dependent. Uh, the first two digits being four, uh, book 33, page 22, this is what the Shays got. She got a pension of, I think it's 18 shillings a week for the loss of three of her sons. That's all they were worth for life. The funny thing is, in 1919, Margaret's husband died. So she'd only one disabled son left from the Great War. Having a, a family of four strapping sons, five sons, before the war and the husband, within a year of, him, uh, of the war ending, she had one disabled son left to her name. Don't tell me that that doesn't devastate any woman. She never got to do what these women did, visited the grave of a loved one in France or Flanders or anywhere during World War I. She had the constant memory of her sons and she couldn't talk to anybody about them because in Ireland, 
We were already having selective amnesia. We were starting our war of independence. We had to leave our uniform British soldiers' heritage behind us. It was meant nothing. It was finished. It was a dead duck. And she now had to, even the parish priest wouldn't empathise with her. Because there were no traitors, because we were fighting the British, weren't we? Modeling Street, Mrs. Catherine O'Connell, and Cornelius Michael Richard, same thing. Uh, M Michael and Cornelius enlisted in Kilkenny, age 14. But they died, they were older, they, they joined up as militiamen. And uh, Irish Guards, Connacht Rangers, Royal Irish Regiment. Here's their record. You have Richard, Michael, Cornelius, Connell. Their father's listed as their next of kin. They're, they're not married. And you can see here that they're modeling street to Kenny. Thomas is their father. Here's their uh, memory cards. We're very lucky that we have their memory cards. Unfortunately, Richard's picture has gone off of his memory card. This is Michael and this is Cornelius, or Con as he was known, the Irish guardsman. He was obviously a bandsman. And for in, just pointing out, if you're ever wondering about uniforms, you are an Irish guardsman if you have four buttons, a gap, and then four more buttons. Because you're the fourth senior guard regiment in the British Army. That's how, that's how they recognize their regiments. Mrs. Catherine Kavanagh from Wolf's Tone Street. James Kavanagh died of illness at home. He's lucky. Why is he lucky he died? He's buried opposite Northern Park. If you ever see the lone Commonwealth War Grave headstone, there's, in, there's two in there, but there's only one really visible. That's, that's uh, James. His brother, Private Thomas Kavanagh, died in Le Pilly the same day as my great-grand-uncle, my great-great-grand-uncle. Uh, he died on that day, and Edward died in, in May. Three Royal Irish Regiment soldiers. Wolf Tone Street, 11 Wolf Tone Street. Here's their pension file. All their names here. Uh, two of the brothers here, one of them was actually married, James was married. And here you can see here all the different, she was getting 15 shillings a week for the loss of two sons for in perpetuity. The sons were never coming back. They gave them a dead man's penny, their medals, and 15 shillings a week, and don't ever talk about them again. That was the way it was. Thankfully now, in Kilkenny, we have a great war memorial. So even though their mothers could never visit their graves, it's easy for us now to go and spend a moment and to reflect and, you know, think about the hardships and the horror that the soldiers are dead and gone, whether you died in agony after eight hours after a gas attack or you were blown up to smithereens and a bomb exploding alongside you, your life ended. The people who carried the, the burden of your memory, it was a burden, it wasn't, you know, they weren't seen as being honourable men. The burden of your memory was left with their mothers and their wives. That is how we moved into 1920s, 30s Ireland. And it wasn't until 1998, if you want to ask me, with the peace process and the unveiling of the Mazine Ridge Ireland of Ireland Peace Park with Mary McAleese, the King of Belgium, and Queen Elizabeth II. That event opened a door in our selective amnesia-affected minds and allowed us to reconnect with our past and our World War I heritage. This is not going to play. We're now moving into our, our War of Independence and our Civil War period. These are the Irish volunteers getting their weapons uh, in, 19, in, in June 1914 down in the Market Cross. The three men I'm going to talk about are Tom Tracy, the first Kilkenny Brigade commander, uh, the most influential man in, our, in, our, the, in my opinion, the singularly most influ influential man in our War of Independence. He was the commander of the Kilkenny Volunteers from 1914 until two days after Bloody Sunday 1920. Until the 23rd of November 1920, Tom managed and, and developed the Kilkenny Brigade to the point where they were operationally effective, able to plan, <coughs> implement and carry out the second only successful attack on an RAC barracks in Ireland, in Hugginstown. And then he was able to lead his brigade into developing independent type actions which would carry on. Unfortunately, Peter de Lucre didn't get a chance to become an effective brigade commander because he was arrested shortly after being elected because Ernie O'Malley's notebook was found to contain his names after Ernie, Ernie was arrested in Kappa in Inishtig while he was down there planning 
an attack on Woodstock House where a company of the Auxiliary Division were posted. And then you have George O'Dwyer, and George O'Dwyer became the, the brigade commander for the rest of the War of Independence after Peter was arrested. This is just a, a French representation of our Bloody Sunday after the events on the 20th of November. And uh, you can see here that there's a certain amount of, you know, in our hearts, like the events that happened in Bloody Sunday, it our War of Independence went into level five overdrive after that. The real harsh fighting ha started after this day. So this is a, a, a seminal event within within the whole Anglo-Irish War. And the Irish volunteers, or the IRA as they were known by now, became very effective. Because unlike the Great War, where when the Britain, Great Britain was fighting the main force of the main enemy from day one in 1914, until the 11th of November 1918. They had to feel like they were fighting the main force of the enemy in Ireland from 1919 to 1921. But then the IRA were, were only fighting whenever, they, whenever it felt right or it was a correct time. So the British were in a war fighting stance all the time. And that has a very detrimental effect on your war fighting capability, actually. This is George DeWire's uh, map of the Kilkenny Brigade area. Uh, drawn uh, when he was given his witness statement. So you can see the nine battalions there. And this is uh, the Kilkenny men taking the barracks over on the 7th of February, 1922. This is a very important picture. Uh, this is uh, Judge Comerford here. If any of you have read his book, which is 1,500 pages long, fair play to you. I, I read the back of it and then I go forward and look for the bits of information I want. Uh, no, it's a, it's a really important primary source of information in relation to the Kilkenny men, particularly of the Coon, Moon, no, Coon, Muckalee, Castlecomer area during our War of Independence. This here is Martin Kiley from Blanchfield Park in, in Gorn, another very important commander during our War of Independence. I don't know any of the rest of the men in it. And as our War of Independence came to a conclusion, and we started to have our, our negotiations and then the treaty and then the split happened in Kilkenny like it happened everywhere else. The main body of the IRA went anti-treaty with Ned Elwood, but the main man that, that was the commander of the Kilkenny Brigade National Army during, during the Civil War was John T. Prout, a Tipperary man, and we won't hold that against him. Uh, and I call it our dishonored, our dishonored heritage. And that means heritage is uncomfortable for us. Because even to this day, we don't like talking about our civil war. And we didn't remember our civil war, by the way, during our decade of centenaries. We left it behind us. We said, no, the committee that advised the Taoiseach and the president said, you know what, let's have a low key thing. Whereas 1916 was brilliant. I marched up. Uh, O'Connor Street as part of the overseas battalion that was going overseas on O'Connor Street. And I swear to God, I could not feel my legs marching up O'Connor Street. And I was a captain at that stage. I wasn't a young soldier. But it had an emotional attachment and connection with me. But our civil war, we didn't want to talk about it. But we did a, We did nearly kick it all off here in Kilkenny. We're, we're good at that. Here we have, uh, between the 2nd and the 5th of May, 1922, the civil war almost starts in Kilkenny. And here's General Prout after talking to all these soldiers because seven locations around Kilkenny City had been taken by anti-treaty volunteers. Uh, the Kilkenny Castle being the main one and St. Canis's Tower, the Round Tower, being the second main one. There were others, there were five others, but they were the main ones. Here are the guys in the barracks getting ready to go down to assault, do a frontal assault on Kilkenny Castle. This here is probably the armoured car that was drove into the castle gate to get to push it, to force it open, to dislodge the anti-treaty volunteers who were causing a lot of hassle down there. Here we have the guys, after taking back off the Republican forces, uh, St. Canis's Tower. The dean is T.E. Winder. And the guy here with the mandolin, I don't know what his story is, really, to be honest with you. He's a very happy man that he's still around, because all these buddies have their rifles and all. This is just a typical Irish thing, isn't it? A random soldier with a musical instrument somewhere. Uh, but uh, they had dislodged the... Uh, now, General Prout had had 
a firefight. The last shots ever fired at the barracks was the 3rd of May, 1922. Because there was a, a sniper up there firing shots at the barracks and General Prout was firing shots back f with a with a, a, a rifle he had for deer hunting. Here's the aftermath of the battle. You can see the dislodged, damaged door of the castle. And here are soldiers. Uh, there is another staged photograph which I didn't bother putting into it. It's, the, it's actually a very good photograph and it's the front cover of um, Owen Swinton Walsh's book on another, I would recommend Owen's book. Uh, it, it forms the front cover of his book. Uh, here are the National Army with all their Republican prisoners. Again, this is Kilkenny, uh, the, the church, which we saw the King's Clyde Royal Rifle Corps eating their dinner there 22 years earlier. Here are the boys using it now as a prison and the guys are about to be released and I like this picture because it's very clear you see anti-treaty Republicans shaking hands with National Army soldiers and it's like you know this, this, this is not going to kick off but what happened two months later our civil war started and why did our civil war what was our civil war fought over if you want to ask me it was really fought over at the end of the day about an, an oath of allegiance to King of England that was the that was the one thing that they couldn't let go on the Republican side. The civil war executions that happened in Kilkenny. Uh, this is a mock up of a photograph, but it's one that only came to light a couple of years ago, and it's from the Dulligan uh, collection. This is actually a very good representation of an execution. The firing squad would have been that close, and uh, the officer and the guys would have had no concept of ricochets or anything like that because. They didn't have really good marksmanship skills as National Army soldiers throughout the War of Independence. They never got became good soldier, good at handling live weapons. Over half of all the soldiers that die in Kilkenny during the Civil War die of negligent or accident discharge, accidental discharges. The arrests were made so. John Murphy and John Phelan, two anti-treaty Republican soldiers, are involved in a raid on She's Town House. Uh, on October the 13th, 1922. They are captured in Bishop's Lock near Venice Bridge on the 13th of December, 1922. The, the National Army send out patrols, they surround the house, the guys are captured. The, within the house, on their person, was enough evidence to, to arrest them. This is a picture off of Google. Edward Law, if anybody remembers Edward, he was a, a very strong member, and it was Edward that got, got my interest going on this. This was Edward's house. He lived out here. Uh, but this is a shed just off the side of the house. This is a picture taken off of Google Maps uh, a couple of years ago by myself. And this is a modern representation of the house. And to give you, a, the house is here. This is uh, Tullahern Round Tower here. This is the road to Bennis Bridge. That's where they were arrested. They were brought into the barracks prison where they were court-martialed. And the day after they were arrested, uh, unfortunately for them, the Republican forces took uh, Thomastown RIC barracks, Castlecomer RIC barracks, and Mullinavat RIC barracks. That put severe pressure on General Prout. On Christmas week, 1922, the gentleman on your left there is a fellow called Frederick Lidwell. Frederick is the captain, staff captain, a legal officer, and he's two IC to a fellow called Joe, Commandant Joe Mooney. And uh, on the 22nd of December, Frederick Lidwell is shot dead by volunteer Edward Kelly accidentally in the battalion orderly room uh, as they're selecting the court martial board. This is the exact order room. This, today, this is officer's accommodation. The officer's mess will be here. Uh, you go in the door here into the room on the right. That was the battalion orderly room. They were selecting the court martial board there. This is the door out of there. As uh, volunteer Kelly was coming out this door, he had cuff of his jacket, got caught in his left jacket, got caught in the door handle. He'd already cocked his rifle illegally and it caused him to squeeze the trigger. He had the safety catch off his rifle. He had an accidental discharge and he shot the top of uh, Frederick Lidwell's head basically off, off him. He, di he died there, right there. Just, the priest made it just before he died and everybody was a uh, uh, had kneeling down and you know saying a few prayers for him, but it didn't help him. He died. Uh, his mother was a widow. Her husband was a a, a lawyer in Dublin, a uh, Mr. Lidwell, who was mentioned by 
in a couple of books um, uh, as being a very famous lawyer of his day. And this is Cahir Davids, a uh, nephew of uh, Michael Davids, and he is the Judge Advocate General of the Irish Army at the time. It's his job to go tell Mrs Lidwell, the recently widowed Mrs Lidwell, that her son is dead. He cycles to her house on Christmas Eve and she's not there, so he leaves a note for her. So that's how she finds out that her son is dead. She's left destitute. Her husband, who was the income earner, and her son, who was now a trainee lawyer, almost finished, were gone. So she's destitute. She sends so many letters, and they're all on her witness, uh, in, her, in her appeal to the Defence Forces for a pension, which she doesn't get. On May the 23rd, she asks Father Gleason, a priest who is famous because he was the priest that administered the absolution to the Munster Fusiliers as they went up Fristenburg Hill in 1915. When he came back, he became the chaplain to the Defence Forces, and uh, she appeals through him. It's unsuccessful. And then you can see here she writes to General Mulcahy. This is her picture in the middle, and you can read the letter. I won't read out the letter now, but the woman has gone from being a woman of means to a woman of no means. Eventually, the army gives her £150 in 1923, another £150 in 1929, and they tell her, don't write to us again in 1937. She keeps writing, but that has no success, I'm sorry to say. The court martial board is eventually formed after uh, Captain Lidwell is removed from the building, and John and uh, uh, the two Johns are found guilty and they're sentenced to death by execution. And this sentence is just, they were uh, sentenced before Christmas. The, the file is sent to Dublin. The judge advocate general says, I don't think this is a, uh, there's an administrative error in this. He was overruled by two members of the army councils and those executions were carried out on the 29th of December, 1922 in James Stevens barracks in the exercise yard. John is from Bishop's Lock. He was born in 1900. His mother and father were living as, I suppose, subsistence farmers out in Castle Comer, or no, out in Venice Bridge. And uh, at, in 1901, there are six people residing in their residence. John is in the Great War. He's awarded the Victory Medal and War Medal. Uh, he, he is a member of the Royal Artillery. He's there until 1919. The 6th of November, 1919, he comes home from World War I. Or... War of Independence is already gone. He immediately joins the 5th Battalion of the Kilkenny Brigade and he becomes a Republican for soldier in, in our Civil War. These are his two last letters. I'm not going to read them out tonight. There is a brilliant film by Kevin Hughes uh, called Dear Mother. You have to watch it. It's available on YouTube, but it's all, also available to come in and sit down in the detention barracks, in, the, in our military barracks. We have a telly set up there. You can sit in one of the cells and watch the film of where of the, the story about the shootings. John was from Thomastown, Dangan Mills in Johnstown. He was married, he had three children. He left his wife destitute, poor old Bridget. Uh, the pro and why I say poor Bridget, if Bridget ever remarried, she was gonna lose any pension she got of the Irish state. And where Mrs. Lidwell got the money in 1923, uh, John Murphy and John Phelan's wife and mother couldn't claim any money until 1932 till the government changed. And the, the new Fianna Fáil government enacted a law to allow people from the Republican side to, uh, to claim their pensions. This is his last letter. This is where the executions happened. Uh, a legacy of John Murphy and John Fielding's executions is that, they, that their appeals continued up to the 1960s, right? Uh, but uh, John Murphy had an elderly sister eventually, and she made a claim, but it was unsuccessful. And... Uh, the Civil War really destroyed lots of lives. There was a, a, a county council meeting and two in the 1940s and two new estates being built in Kilkenny at the time were going to be called Murphy uh, uh, and Phelan Terraces. That never happened. The, Dang, the Dangan estate in Thomastown was supposed to be called after John Phelan and it didn't happen. Thankfully now the two guys have uh, memorials which they didn't have up until last year. So now I'm coming to the end, right? I've told you some nice stories from our, well, and sad stories, to be honest. Uh, the 6th Brigade came to Kilkenny after the Second World War. The 3rd Battalion were there in 1970 when the, when the uh, emergencies, we, we never had, we don't do terminology about war good in Ireland. 
because we called World War II an emergency. <laughs> and we called the Trump, uh, Civil War in Northern Ireland the Troubles. Right. So, so you can see during the Troubles, the 3rd Battalion moved to Kilkenny to train new recruits for the Army. The 30th Battalion was formed in 1977, disbanded in 1998, and the 3rd Battalion have been headquartered in James Stevens Barracks from 1998 as a headquarters uh, until to this day. This is a very important photograph for me, because where we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kyohan, who was in the 30th Battalion with me as a second lieutenant when I was a, a corporal, and this is Stephen McOwen, who's the current battalion commander of the Irish-Polish uh, battalion in South Lebanon. The 123rd Battalion are almost three months through a very difficult tour of duty. Not for, in the sense that they're under fire, right? but it's the, the added security precautions that men have to take to make sure that in the event of hostilities becoming more evident in South Lebanon, because they're there already, that they have the capability to protect themselves. So I'm coming to the very end. This is, you saw me with my arm around a young man called Mick Wall at the start of the presentation. Well, this is me, I, I'm a little bit older in this picture, with Mick Wall, who is now my brother-in-law. I barely knew Mick in the first picture. While I was in the Lebanon, he was writing to his then wife, Karen, one night, and I said, who are you writing to? And he said, I'm writing to my wife's sister. I said, I'll send her a note 30 odd years later. We're, we're married and still married and, and that. But Mick is my brother-in-law. This is me as a company commander in Lebanon in 2000. And Mick is my company sergeant. So if you think there's not a good career to be had in the Irish army, please advise any young person who's lost in where they want to go in the world to try the defense forces. That's my little recruitment drive for tonight. And I had the really good fortune, and my last trip overseas, I was the boss of the camp, and as the boss of the camp, I got to have a personal few minutes with on Tukran. I was in charge of his visit to Camp, Clar uh, the camp Shamrock in uh, September uh, 2020, which is over nearly four years ago, which is amazing me. And on that note, there's a select bibliography. I'm going to leave the presentation, which is obviously, and on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much. I've gone four minutes over my allocated time. I was expecting a sidewinder from the left any moment. So I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thanks.